This week on the show, I sit down to talk Thrawn with author Timothy Zahn. Plus, we get a deeper insight into the story elements of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. This is the Star Wars Show. From the Lucasfilm headquarters in San Francisco, here's your host, Andy and Anthony. Hello and welcome to the Star Wars Show, the only Star Wars show that's normally filled with 80s references, but this week will be filled with 90s references because our normal writer is on vacation and has been replaced with a writer that's 10 years younger. Yeah, get ready for all that lip smacker, Lisa Frank, Beanie Baby, Space Jam, and fun. Ugh, as if. Let's say bye 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 to this and go to the news. John Favreau is back at it again and giving fans a quick look behind the curtain of The Mandalorian's production. On Saturday, the director posted an image to his Instagram of a drawing by new to Instagram writer and director Dave Filoni that appears to be of a blaster carrying IG droid yelling music. The impressive drawing was paired with the caption, scoring season one of The Mandalorian. The Mandalorian premieres on Disney Plus November 12th. Also last week, StarWars.com revealed three images from the upcoming book, Star Wars Myths and Fables. Painted by Grant Griffin, these images include a menacing skeletal Darth Vader, a heroic Ralph McQuarrie-inspired Jedi, and an unknown character standing on a hill with a Black Spire outpost esque background. Written by George Mann, Myths and Fables tells fantastical stories from the Star Wars universe, told as fairy tales and legends being passed down from generation to generation. The book is available for pre-order now and will hit store shelves August 6th. If you want to see more of the images up close and read more about Myths and Fables, along with more breaking news from around the galaxy, check out StarWars.com slash SWS. Hey, did you know we are 29 days away from the opening of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at Walt Disney World in Florida? Huh, I can't believe your 29-day alarm went off and mine didn't. Hmm. Huh, interesting. Well, to help feed your need for all that great Black Spire Outpost content, here's a closer look at how Walt Disney Imagineering teamed up with Lucasfilm to create and expand the story of Batu. Do you have yours set to... Yeah, it's got the little, the little thing right there. It's weird. I normally have 29 days before anything important. Mm -hmm. I have an alarm going yeah. off. It's the most important milestone. Mm -hmm. One thing about storytelling in Star Wars is we have one universe of story. One of the great opportunities we have is we work very, very closely with all the other creators who are working on all the other forms of Star Wars storytelling. We kind of make sure that everything we're doing all weaves together and makes sense. The breakthrough moment in developing Star Wars Galaxy's Edge was thinking about the park as a setting where stories occur. And that story focus is what made it clear that it not only had to be a new world, but it had to be a world where interesting things happen. The story of Batuu is that it's kind of off the beaten path planet that in the early days of hyperspace travel, ships would go to stock up and resupply before they ventured out into wild space. And now Batuu's kind of fallen a little bit from its glory days. Now it's the place where people go when they want to get lost, when they want to be off the radar. We work with the designers, the architects, the ride engineers, landscape designers, food and beverage, merchandise, to come together and tell a cohesive story that truly holds the DNA of Star Wars. We thought it very important to carve out a space that had to exist on its own track because it had all sorts of considerations that needed to be thought of separate from all the considerations that go into making a movie or making a TV show. But once it gelled and we came to understand what it was, we're able to communicate our discoveries to others storytellers. The story weaves into all of our current storytelling. It was mentioned in Solo, A Star Wars Story twice. It's shown up in Thrawn Alliances. Now we're doing an entire publishing program around it, which includes various books, comics, all kinds of exciting things. So we really are treating it as a part of true Star Wars storytelling. You want to have different ways to experience this galaxy and the saga, this epic storytelling. And how do we challenge ourselves to continually be surprising? to our Star Wars fans as well as our Disney guests. I'm joined today by Timothy Zahn. Oh, it's so good to have you here. I always love talking to you. Thank Welcome. you. It's always great to be here. Thrawn Treason's out. Yes. You're finishing up the second trilogy with this awesome character that you've yep. been working on. I'd love to hear about how you're feeling about wrapping up this new chapter in your Star Wars authoring life and with Thrawn. It's always a little bit of a downer. Okay, this is all done now. What do we do after this? But it was fun to bring back some of the characters from the first book, do some connections with the second book, Alliances, mm -hmm. and just bring things to a rousing conclusion with the possibility of something further down the line if and when that part of the timeline becomes available to me. When you were working on Heir to the Empire, did you ever imagine that he would have this sort of legacy and be so beloved in the community? You have no idea what characters, what storyline is going to connect with the readers. Mm -hmm. At that point, frankly, we didn't know if there were any Star Wars fans out there. 
Right, so yeah. the original Thrawn trilogy was an experiment in its own right. The fact that Thrawn has persisted and been a popular character this long, I would never have believed it had you told me back in 1991. You know, now 30 years later, was there anything that you discovered about him or about yourself in the process that was kind of different this time? Not really, because a lot of the fun of doing Thrawn is not just the tactics and playing both sides of the chessboard, yeah. but it's how are people going to react to him? That multiple dynamic is part of the storytelling, part of the fun of writing these yeah. books. Eli Vanto is a good example of that. He starts out not really liking this disruption in his planned career, his planned life, and gradually comes around to, you know, this may be the best thing that ever could have happened to me. This gives the reader somebody to look through their eyes and see how they would fit into this mass story around him. So now this time around, you know, you're writing these stories at the same time when Thrawn's being used in other Star Wars content. Yeah. Did you work closely with, you know, Dave, for example, yeah. who was using Thrawn? There are several places in Rebels where he meets Colonel Yularen, Governor Price, and Moff Tarkin, but none of those felt like a first meeting. So I can make these connections. So it's boundaries, but it's also opportunities. So speaking of, you know, Thrawn's appearance in Rebels, do you know where he went? I would like to know where he went. I've got ideas of my own, but at this point, that's off the table. Dave Filoni's got first crack at that. So you really don't know? I really don't know. Oh, that's wild. That's like the best kept secret in Star Wars right now, I think. We could all find Dave Filoni and see what we could bribe him with, you know. I haven't seen the guy. He's really busy. <laughs> yeah, that is the other thing. He's very busy with a lot of other cool projects. So speaking of other cool projects that are going on in Star Wars, what's exciting you right now? Looking forward to The Mandalorian, yeah. particularly with Dave and John in charge of that one. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that. Galaxy's Edge, we're going to the park in October, hoping to be able to get into that if it's not oh, too awesome. crowded. You're Timothy Zahn. You can get in. Like, you <laughs> can, like call someone. I keep, well, I keep dropping hints at people, and, and so far nobody's picked up on one, so. Hopefully we can get you in. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> try. I'll try and pull some strings. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. So convention season's in full swing, and you're staying really busy. I mean, you're doing a whole circuit. Where yep. can fans find you? I've got a quick tour schedule hitting about every two weekends till around November. It's all listed in the notes section of my Facebook page. Thanks again for coming by. I'm so glad I got a few minutes with you. Well, thanks. All. You're watching the Star Wars show. I love that you got to sit down and talk with Timothy Zahn this week. Yeah, it's always awesome to sit and talk in depth about our favorite blue boy, Thrawn. Yes. Hopefully, Timothy will come back for another chat soon. Last week on the show, we asked to hear about your favorite moments from the Clone Wars, and you all delivered. Michael Vitti said he liked how the Clone Wars humanized the clone troopers, gave them all unique personalities and desires, and how they formed a brotherhood. Couldn't agree more. Matt Rushing shared that he loved the entire Mortis trilogy. Same. Yep. Because it was when George cracked open the Force in the most unexpected and incredible Way. And last but not least, Joe wrote that he loved when Jar Jar distracted the Trade Federation with his art in order to save the people of Ryla. So many great Jar Jar moments. Every Jar Jar moment is a great Jar Jar yes. moment. And hey, thank you for watching. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And remember that MC Double Def Do says, don't copy that floppy. Thanks for watching, and may the force be with you. That was a deep cut. Very deep cut, but an important cut, because otherwise you have floppies everywhere. I didn't even know you could copy floppies. You shouldn't. What percentage of people watching this have no idea what a floppy is? <laughs>